know if anyone joins us. All right, you're all set. Excellent. Thank you, Athena, and thank you, Angela, for doing our minutes today. Um, this is, it is 2.02 in the afternoon on July 21st, 2020, and I am calling the meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order because um, we have a quorum under Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the mm -hmm. Open Meeting Law, NPL Chapter 30A, Section 20. Uh, that allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the CRC. This meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and all votes that we take will be by roll call. At this time, I'm gonna call upon each committee members na by name so that we can confirm that we can hear you and you can hear us. And afterwards, we will mute the mics and go into our meeting. Amel. Present. Uh, Mandy Johan. Present. Evan Ross. Present. And Steve Schreiber? Here. And will be absent today. Um, with that, we will move into our agenda. And our agenda, the first item of business is the bylaw banning the use of the wild and exotic animals. Um, this is sponsored in the council by Councillor Balmilne. Um, we have a number of uh, resident and community sponsors present today to go with us through this and they are Laura Hagen, Cheryl Becker, and Kara Holmquist, and Rebecca Schwartz. So we look forward to having everyone here to join in this conversation. Um, uh, at this time what I will say is I'm going to share my screen to put up what is a combined um, bylaw compiled. We have a, had a lot of requests from a lot of diff different sources for potential amendments. Um, and then you will notice that it looks a little different than the original proposed amendment. It is an attempt to put it into what our general bylaws look like um, without actually changing or removing any language of the bylaw um, or intent of the bylaw. Um, and the, the community sponsors have seen this version before, so this is not new to them. Um, and so the plan today is to go through each section and particularly each set of proposed revisions to talk about them, see where the community sponsors and the counselor sponsor might be with them, and as a committee talk about them. And hopefully in the next 40 minutes or so, we'll be able to get through the whole thing and maybe get to a vote on whether to recommend this to the council. Um, so we're going to start with the penalties section. Are there any comments that, and I will remind any, everyone, including those community sponsors, if you want to talk about a section, just hit the raise hand button and I will recognize you. This, we hope, is sort of a conversation collaborative process to get through this. Um, are there any comments, uh, questions, recommended, or potential changes to the penalty section, the criminal enforcement and the non-criminal disposition? And I will try to monitor all of the hands. I am not seeing any at this time. Let's see if I can get everyone on my screen. Oh, Rebecca has a hand. Well, I'm sorry. Um, raise hand like this, or is there oh, something yeah. that I don't see? There's, there's. If you show the participants, uh, the list of yeah. participants at the very bottom, there should be a button that says raise hand. Got it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's the easiest for me. I'm going to try and watch, but I don't always have every video on screen, so I don't always see the actual waving of a hand. Um, so I, I am not see Evan. I, I almost didn't say this because it's not actually in our jurisdiction, but I feel like it's better to fix now. But non-criminal disposition can't be arranged, correct? I don't think so. I'm not sure. It's why I wasn't bringing it up now because I think I, it's a it, GOL it's, question, but I it's feel a like GOL question. It's not our question, but I guess the, the point would be if it can't be arranged, what I would ask the sponsor is there's a couple of options um, and we could potentially draft them today. One, if it can't be arranged, one option is the first offense, second offense with different numbers at each offense, um, different values for non-criminal. The other one is to just pick a number. Um, and if there's a preference from you or from the committee as to which way to go, um, maybe it's better to have that now before it goes to GOL, just in case it 
it can't be arranged. Evan and I had this issue with a previous one and we're trying to rack our brains as to what the answer was without actually having looked it up. So from the sponsor's thoughts on that, uh, Laura. So just to offer context um, in your decision making about this, um, most of the other animal ordinances within the last few years that have passed it, passed um, in Massachusetts have been just the flat 300, which I think is the most that you're allowed to do without you know, going to the state legislature. Um, so that's been what's been pretty common uh, across the state, whether it's circus or puppy mill, that kind of thing, but just wanted to at least share that information with you in that context. Um, and Rebecca? Um, so it, yeah, it also seems to me that having the flat fee at the 300 is best because, I mean, if you, if you have the offense, you should just have it at that one level. It's just my opinion. Shalini, Evan, or Steve, um, if we were to delete this, would that be at this point something you would support if we go like that? I'm, I'm seeing nods from, Shalini, from Evan and Steve and Shalini if we just make it the flat 300 and a nod from her. So we're gonna do that. Any other questions on the, this set of sort of penalties? Thoughts before we move on? Anything on the purpose? I am not seeing any, so we will move on. The definition section has some things I think we need to talk about. Um, unless someone wants to discuss circus person or traveling show, we are going to move to um, the one, the first one that has some comments, um, which is the, um, and, and I put these abbreviations in and now I don't remember what the abbreviation stands for, but there was a revision proposed by the PSPCA. Um, maybe it was supposed to be the ASPCA or the MSPCA um, uh, that, that added the words including hybrids, um, uh, including hybrids with domestic species, um, that with a comment that said wild captive animals are hybridized with both other captive wildlife and domestic species. Um, so it would change the definition from all these orders, whether born in the wild or in captivity, and also any or all of their hybrids, which referred only to wild, um, the hybrids of those, um, to add that hybrids of those listed below with a domestic species too. Uh, thoughts from the committee or any comments or thoughts from the community sponsors on that potential addition, um, since it was not in your original proposal. I am not seeing anything. I'm going to assume that means that the community sponsors would be okay with that addition. Um, I am seeing nods of the heads with that. Um, what about our committee members? Is that something that they would support? Uh, do you wanna have a conversation about that? Um, I, I guess my only question would be what, could, could we get an example of what a hybrid of one of these animals with a domestic species might be? Does anyone, just to give me an idea. Um, Laura, I think you're, you're looking like a rice speak. Yeah, <laughs> cats are pretty common um, where you, uh, they hybridize a wild cat with a domestic cat um, and you've got the, the resulting animal is usually quite wild in nature. Um, that's, that's one animal um, that's I think more common than probably anything. Um, that, that, that would probably be the most common case you don't there, there are cases where they have people, what they claim to be wolf-dog hybrids. Um, I haven't seen those in Massachusetts too much, but I know they do exist in like roadside zoos and that kind of thing. So that is possible. But I think the more, the most common is the, the felid uh, hybridization with domestic animals. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Any other comments, questions? I'm not seeing much from our committee. Um, given that, I am going to assume that this committee is okay with that addition, since I've already seen the sponsors are okay with that addition without having to go to a vote. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is remove the comment so that it just shows in there. Um, and then we're going to go down to the list of animals. Um, Evan, in our first review, you had wanted to potentially add llamas and alpacas to this list. Um, is that still an addition you would like to make? And if so, um, I'd like to hear from the sponsors on their thoughts on that one. Yes, Evan? Oh, sorry, I was waiting on sponsors. Uh, yeah, I, I, to me, uh, given especially what we have at the Hadley Barn at UMass and the potential for them I don't know, maybe to bring them into town of domestic llamas and alpacas. That's something that I would like to see added. And Rebecca. Um, yes, this is a, a good addition and I'm very happy with it because it was a good suggestion and it should go in there. Okay. Um, I don't think I see any other hands. So unless I see any hands opposing that at this time, I will delete that comment and we will leave that addition in. Um, and I will make a note of that. For the report. Um, the next one is additions proposed by the MSPCA pinnipeds and giraffes, gir giraffidae, pinnipeds they said all species and sea lion type issues um, and giraffidae are giraffes. Um, and their comment was that they're used in traveling shows and circuses that exhibit in Massachusetts. Um, the one question I have about this, I just saw up in where we just added llamas and alpacas, giraffes are included. So I would, uh, I'm not sure we need to specifically put them separate. Um, Rebecca, what are your thoughts? I see your hand. Oh, was that uh, an old hand? That, yeah, that's an old hand. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry um, uh, Laura or some, Kara, do you have a? Yeah, that's actually, I'm fine. Uh, that's, yeah, I just missed that because that is the, the giraffe day is the family, I think, and the order is the, um, tell I'm not a scientist, the, the uh, Artidodactylia, and so we could just leave it in there. That's perfect. We could, so we could take out that giraffe edition. Thank you for flagging that. And what about sea lions? What are the thoughts on adding the pinniped, I don't know whether it's an order or family that would include sea lions. I, I assume it might also include seals, but I'm, again, not a scientist that knows this. Thoughts from the committee? I'm getting a lot of shrugs. <laughs> so with those shrugs, um, I'm not seeing a lot of opposition to that. Um, I Community sponsors are seeming to shake their heads that they're okay with that addition. So with the committee not showing any um, you know, comments to that at this point, my, as you can tell, my thought is to leave in the requested additions if we as a committee don't have much of a comment about it. Um, so I will delete the comment and you can see the change there um, is to delete the giraffe die um, because it's covered up there, but leave the pinnipeds in um, and we will move on. So the next one is what a wildlife, oh, Evan. So I guess, um, so two things. So one, um, I just wanna make sure we actually bring up because it, it was brought up last time and it was brought up in the materials provided, was I, in, in addition to llamas and alpacas, I had also suggested camels um, mm. as something that I had seen at some of UMass's uh, farm shows that were brought in from private owners. Um, that was not added and there was a response in our packet to why uh, Campbell should not be included, um, which I found fine. Um, but I, I did want to at least bring that up because that was an issue I brought up last time was camels. Um, and then the only other thing, I guess I have a question is I, I was, as I was trying to think back to what these things might look like, right? I was thinking of sort of petting zoos that I've been to and, you know, what animals would be okay and then what wouldn't. 
um, at versus circuses, um, which I loved as a kid, but recognized are problematic now. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of, and I don't know if this is something that even happens, but I do remember when I was a kid, uh, we used to have a lot of like wildlife rehabilitators that would bring sort of educational animals into the schools. And I don't know if our schools do that. I, I know we have someone that does hawks, which are not on this list, um, birds of prey. Um, but I'm wondering if, if there was a thought that we wanted to prevent those types of things, or if this is constructed um, to to allow them. I didn't necessarily see any animals that might be in that, other than I do know a, a, a possum was brought into my school once, which would be uh, banned under the marsupial under E. Um, and so I guess I was just I was I was curious. I saw this sort of as the tar the target being mostly circuses and, and perhaps petting zoos that have like elephant rides and giraffe rides and stuff like that. Um, but just some thoughts on some of these other more educational things, or is, is the feeling that the exceptions cover those sufficiently? Rebecca? Um, hi, okay. So um, the camels, um, you know, I, I thought about a lot and they're, they're not really domestic animals. Um, and they are, you know, you know, they were used by circuses and zoos, uh, the Big E, the Comerford Zoo had them, I think two years ago was, they were videotaped really abusing these animals, the, the camels, and forcing them to give rides, they were collapsing. Um, they're not, I don't, they're not domestic animals. So, you know, though they maybe have brought them to these events, I, I just feel like um, they just may not be able to bring camels anymore because there's really no teaching purpose um, it's not like, you know, llamas and alpacas, there are farms around here, they're used domestically for wool and whatever other purpose, where the camels really are wild animals. Um, and um, it just, I just felt like they shouldn't be allowed anymore because they really don't serve a purpose educationally for the barn events or any other teaching purpose. Um, so that's why I didn't want to put those back in. And yeah, I purposely didn't address them because I don't want to see them allowed, basically. <laughs> um, and then as far as, I mean, the, the intent, as you kind of mentioned, is to limit, you know, the circuses, animals traveling for our entertainment and forced to perform acts. Um, the idea of, um, a hawk or a rehabilitated possum for school children to see. I mean, that's not a traveling exhibition. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the terminology, I mean, Laura can probably address that better, but the intent is not to limit that type of activity. Um, so I don't know, maybe Laura, you could explain how that's, you know, put into the language here to allow that. Yeah, sure. And I think, uh, um, uh, Councilor Ross, you hit it right on the head, which is that it's the, the functionality, it's done that functionally by limiting the species that are impacted. So many of those like educational exhibits that are going to schools, they're often reptiles, for example. Um, so those you'll not see listed in here. And, you know, as Rebecca said, the idea is to impact those animals that are being used in circuses. Um, and so, you know, marsupials, for example, often kangaroo are animals, you know, that, so that are more apt to be used in a circus. You know, if, if it made you feel more comfortable to exclude possums um, from the list to, you know, just make sure we're not inadvertently hitting those particular um, you know, educational uh, exhibitors. I mean, often those opossums are, you know, maybe rehabbed animals that, you know, couldn't be re-released to the wild and that kind of thing. So they're not often animals that are raised for the purpose of being exhibited. Um, but I think other than maybe that limited example, the uh, limited nature of the list should prevent it from impacting, you know, I, I to my knowledge, you know, we, we don't have and shouldn't have uh, educational exhibits that include monkeys, you know, or pr any primates or bears, you know, coming to school. So I, I think that that, I think functionally it should do that. But if there's another like exception we need to add in, 
um, then that you know could be a, a strategy. Okay, can I just quickly follow up? I, so I guess Sorry, I'm not, I myself. Yes. <laughs> um, I, so I guess I'm thinking less so of trying to. I, I don't want to play this game where we try and think of every possible animal that might be right. I, I guess my my question was the intent which you answered, and then if the exceptions, specifically the exception of any wildlife sanctuary, um, would kind of cover that specific thing instead of trying to carve out animals. Got it. Um, yeah, and so I think um, I think it should. Um, you know, like for example, I know sometimes NASA Audubon has animals there, five hundred one c three. So for the for the most part, I if, if they're if they're uh, under the IRS code, if they've taken that you know step of being a five hundred one c three and they meet the other requirements, so they're not breeding animals for exhibition. I think that's another important part of the um, wildlife sanctuary exemption. Then this should cover um, those those activities. All right, perfect. That was the way I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I recognize we have one attendee who has come for this. Uh, I'm going to get through the exceptions before I go to you, Christina. Um, so I'm, I'm not ignoring you, um, but I, I, will, I will take public comment on this issue as we move through. So I think with no more comments there, we're going to, um, we've got this propaganda change to propagation. I, that was just a typo. So I'm not sure we need to discuss that one. I just wanted it to be seen that it was happening. Um, and then it brings us to um, a lot of these revisions here. Um, the exception section, which is sort of the, well, actually we, I skipped over the prohibition section. Any comments, questions about the prohibition section that, that says unlawful for any person to conduct, sponsor, walk, exhibit, or operate a traveling show or circus that includes live wild or exotic animals on any public or private land within the town. That's sort of the heart of the bylaw. Um, I, I am not seeing any questions, uh, comments, so we will move on to the exceptions. This is the one where we got a lot of comments on. Um, so what doesn't get in included in the prohibition? Uh, so we'll start with number one, institutions accredited by, and the change is to put the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The revision was stated as an update to the actual name of the AZA. Um, I, I am going to guess that if that is the correct name, that we are okay with that change um, to make sure that we're referring to that organization correctly. Um, unless someone raises their hand to indicate they are against that, we will move on to the next one. And I will delete this comment. So then any questions about number two, wildlife sanctuary? I think we might've just covered that one. And then we come to what was three, now is three and four. They're all very similar. So the, and I'm gonna explain this for the benefit of the public and all, the original proposal that Rebecca, you and all, you and you submitted to Shalini to submit to the council, I believe had the first number three that is now lined out, any museum, educational, governmental, or medical institution institution, blah, blah, blah. And then when it came to this council, that had been deleted, I believe. Um, and once it's been in this committee, we have received a couple of requests. The new number three, the one that is non labeled number three, a performance that takes place at a non-mobile permanent institution of other, it might be supposed to be, or other fixed facility, provided that the covered animal is not transported to such location for the purpose of such performance is the language that PETA provided. Um, and then there was language provided by the MSPCA um, that suggested, I did not fix some of these, um, a similar language, the chapter shall not apply to an ex exhibition that takes place as a non-mobile permanent institution or other fixed facility provided that a uh, covered animal is not transported to such location for the purpose. So it's very similar to the one from PETA. Um, and they actually said that they don't, they believe that 
if that is adopted, number one would not be necessary, according to the comment I have here on here. Sorry, I keep scrolling because that, that comment ends up that I can't see it because of other things I have up. So I'm going to stop scrolling so people <laughs> aren't doing that. <laughs> um, so that's, we need to, I think, discuss this. I think my first question to the community sponsors, Rebecca and, and crew, is what was the reason for originally removing it? And then what are your thoughts on either the PETA or the MSPCA recommendation to put it back in? Um, Rebecca? Sorry, um, actually I'd like to defer this to MSPCA and the Humane Society because it was based on their recommendations. Okay, Laura? Sure, I can start um, and Kara, from the MSPC, if you want to jump in as well, please. I think these were joint comments that we provided. So um, we provided them alongside the MSPCA. So the concern with uh, number three was that it was too broad. Um, circuses and traveling shows will often try to characterize themselves as educational um, and use those kinds of exemptions um, to continue performances. And while I do realize there is not currently a circus coming to Massachusetts, you know, more and more cities and towns are taking up these types of bands. And so I I think they will be looking for other places where they can go. So I just wanted to, um, and we were looking at this, wanted to make sure that we were hitting, you know, what we wanted to hit with the exemption. And so one, the suggestion that was made by both PETA and the um, MSPCA and the Humane Society, which are, I think, the same or similar, was language that had actually been built into the proposed state law um, to exempt facilities like, for example, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums facilities, or maybe Mass Audubon if they were doing a, you know, a, an exhibition of rehabbed animals at their facility. Um, you know, because the, I, I call it the bricks and mortar exemption. So if you have a stationary facility, um, then that would allow that institution, a permanent institution, um, you know, to engage in a display if that animal's not being, you know, transported for the purposes of that display. And then that would also encompass, um, you know, I, I understand, you know, UMass Amherst is there. And so there was some concern about, well, what about animals that may be handled in the lab or something like that. And so the idea, and again, with the broader kind of language that was brought in from the state bill to, um, to kind of encompass those things with some more kind of language that doesn't bring in those educational exemptions and those kind of things that can be misused, um, you know, by, by circuses and traveling shows who are trying to kind of get around a ban. Um, so that was the goal with the, the proposed change. Um, so I guess my question is, the, the thought then from the community sponsors is to essentially add in number three. Number four is the same other than the mistype that I did on number three that I would correct, um, but, but put that back in uh, because it is more um, directed and confined language and, and you guys would support adding that back in? Uh, support number, num whatever numbers three and the new That's number three. Yes, yeah, the old uh, number not three. Not the old one, one, not the one that's lined yes. out, but. Right, correct, the new, yes. The yeah. new, there's two of them, we'd only put one of them in. <laughs> yes, yeah. And committee thoughts? The listed three and four are the same other than one just has the preferencing. One's an exhibition, one's a performance. Evan? I guess, I guess I'm a little, I'm trying to reconcile the last clause there. Um, uh, uh, nope, actually, that I misread this. Uh, provided that the animal is not transported to such a location for such performance. And then I'm looking at the definition of traveling show, which is, means any mobile or stationary actor exhibition, blah, blah, blah. And this is um, where the animals are taken from their permanent residence and required to walk or travel for any distance. And, and I guess I'm trying to figure out what that actually means like if it's a if it's a station if it's a brick and mortar place and the animals 
on one side of the park and then it has to walk across the park to its exhibition. Is that not allowed under this, even though it's a brick and mortar because they're transported for some distance? In, in my reading, it would be fine because they're not they're not transported to the location okay. um, and it, it is a the exemption applies to even that um, traveling show prohibition um, because it's a it's a broad based exemption to the prohibition. So um, that so it would those those would be fine. And that's often what like an AZA uh, American the Association of Zoos and Aquariums facility would do is, you know, they may they may take an animal out you know, within the facility, very limited animals, but yeah. Does that answer the question, Counselor? Yeah. Okay. So I have a question to follow up on that. Um, I mean, we don't have a zoo in Amherst, um, but my experience with some zoos are sometimes they do like zoo parties um, where you can, where they may bring animals into a house or, you know, a, a away from the zoo, not even traveling across the zoo, but still on the property, but off the zoo property to some, you know, for a birthday party or something. Um, if we leave one in, that would still be allowed for the zoo. If we leave, if we take one out, but put three in, I'm not sure it would be. Am I reading that correctly? So, um, so uh, not, not quite. So the reason, the reason that that is not correct is because, so the Association of Zoos and Aquariums does not engage in those types of house party situations. The only kind of live um, ex exhibition type thing that they're going to do, like I said, is they may have a smaller, sometimes they're smaller uh, cats, wild cats, sometimes there are other animals that they'll take out as, I think they call them animal ambassadors or something like that, um, that they'll use, you know, for public education that are not actually in their cage. So the AZA's uh, guidelines and rules would not permit anyone taking any of these listed species into a home or anything like that. Um, and so uh, if you left number one in, that still wouldn't Okay. I guess it effectively wouldn't be permitted because the AZA doesn't engage in that type of activity. Okay. So it's, I'm not hearing anything from our committee. I am going to, based on that and the sponsors, delete that one. Performance or exhibition, one had performance, one had exp exhibition. I'm fixing the typo. Um, and I will get rid of the comments. Pardon me while I, I will get rid of the comments. Oops, that's not the right one. Um, as we finish this, let me. So that would leave number three to be a performance that takes place at a non mobile permanent institution or other fixed facility provided that the covered animal is not transported to such location for the purpose of such performance. And I'm getting nods from the committee and nods from the community sponsors. That moves us down to, um, whoops, I somehow, oh, it, it got moved up when I deleted four, it got moved up. It was five. It, it brings us down to what were five and six, um, and those are institutes of higher learning and any demonstrations or exhibitions hosted by a college or university for bona fide educational or research purposes. Um, let me change my thing so I can see who provided what. Um, I, I had brought this up um, at the last time and so I actually contacted Amherst College and Hampshire College and UMass um, with the bylaw um, and, and asked them how it might affect whatever they're doing with animals. I, I, was, I emailed the groups that deal with research on animals or I, I, I don't even know what they're called. They have some weird long name um, that, that do all of the approval of using animals in research on the campus. Um, 
I have not heard back from UMass other than a thank you for contacting us and I've recontacted them a couple of times. I think they're dealing with some more important things right now. Um, I did hear back from Amherst College. I have not heard back from Hampshire College probably for the same reason, um, but, but Amherst College did get back to me and the one, the language that they requested was this, any demonstrations or exhibitions hosted by a college or university for bona fide educational or research purposes. Um, I believe this one was, I might've deleted the comment already, but might have been by PETA or someone else, or even you all in response to my concern. I, it came from someone that was not me. <laughs> and I apparently just deleted the comment to indicate who it might have come from. Um, uh, maybe it was me, but I don't think it was. Um, so I would like a discussion on that because I am, I, personally, I'm leaning towards number five, the one requested by Amherst College, but I would like to hear from the community sponsors on that language, um, their thoughts, um, and and also on our from our committee. So Rebecca. Um, I think that comment, uh, I saw it on there before it came from ABI, Animal Defenders International, possibly. I, I don't think that was from us. But that is probably true, that. And, and Christina yeah. is on the, on the, in the audience, so maybe I'll right. go to her. Oh, okay. Do you want um, to go to her right now? Um, let me get my participants up. Um, Christina, if you would like to speak to that addition, if it was you, she has raised her hand, so I will, I will allow you to talk and try and unmute you, un unmute, and you can respond. Sure, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I merely suggested that because it's a fairly simple lang um, language that's well accepted. I certainly would see the reason to support going with the information or the request by Smith and Amherst College because the two phrases are duplicative in my opinion. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, do you have any other comments? Um, so I guess my only question is, I mean, how do you um, define a bona fide educational purpose? And as I said before, I mean, the idea is not to limit this type of thing, because like the universities do great work in conservation and, you know, I'm like a full, like very involved with that actually. But it just, I, I just worry that, how do you stop someone who decides that they think it's educational for people to see, I don't know, elephants and they want to bring a circus to, to campus. I, I'm just like not sure how to, how to protect that. Does anyone have any thoughts or comments? Laura? Sorry, it's just unmuting myself. Um, I share Rebecca's concern, you know, um, because you do kind of leave it open um, <clears throat> with a broad-based exemption like this, where if they want to do something on campus and they, and as I said, you know, these circuses and traveling shows do say, we're educational, we're promoting con conservation. So there is, I think, in this exemption, as it's written, some level of trust built into, um, <clears throat> built into kind of trusting the universities that they would abide by the purpose and spirit of the ordinance. Um, I would say that I think that the way this is written gives me less pause than the way the original exemption three was written because it is narrower because it would basically have to be one of the local universities that are sponsoring a circus um, to bring them on. So it gives me less pause than what was originally there. And I, I understand the concern. They're a really big part of the Amherst community. Um, so I, um, I share Rebecca's concern but it's less of a concern than it was with the original language. So if this is something that, you know, the, the council feels they need to do to move it forward, you know, we could live with it. But I, I think Rebecca's concern is a very, very valid one. And so if there is some way, you know, I think that I, I have, you know, I, it's hard for me to imagine them saying, oh yes, we're gonna you know, bring an elephant here and it's, there's some bona fide research purpose for bringing an elephant to UMass Amherst. Um, but the way it's written, that could feasibly happen. So, um, so that's kind of it, you know. Thank you. Um, any thoughts from fellow committee members before I go back to Rebecca and Christina?
Um, I have a comment. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so this is just a, a weird fact, but things like the Mullen Center and all those fields, I think those are all in Hadley. So if we were to, if UMass were to bring the circus to town, that would be the most likely place that they would bring them. I'm not sure what that means, but um, I don't have a problem with the way this is written. Uh, well, I guess we also have to be aware that we're also only talking about that part of the university, which is in Amherst. Thank you. Um, Rebecca. Um, so also just um, based on what Laura said, also like, I, I just want to clarify. I mean, I, we are a university town. I mean, you know, yeah. love this town because we're a university town. I support the colleges and universities and don't want to get in the way at all you know, of the education and the public outreach and all. So, you know, I'm just that my first thought, you know, is, you know, what is bona fide? You know, does this open, does this completely open the door um, or not? So I, I guess my question maybe is to the council members, like, what do you think? Do you think this is, uh, you know, a, do you think this will kind of protect this bylaw? I mean, based on what you say that, you know, that's, kind of is important to know. So so I guess my thoughts are, since I'm the one that, that sought this out, um, I, I am really looking to protect them from the animals they have on campus being suddenly disallowed. And like I said, I don't know exactly what colleges keep what animals, but it came from sort of Evans. We know some of them raise what could be considered domestic. Maybe we haven't included them all in this list or some are in there and we haven't excluded them all. Um, so for anything they're doing for research, but then if they have them for potential research or, you know, UMass is a farming community who knows, you know, like I said, I don't know exactly what animals they, they have throughout campus for that. If they want to have a tour of their stables and happen to have an animal that's on this list, I don't want them to be prohibited from having a tour of their stables or even bringing that animal onto campus for that purpose since it's the university um you know that i i'm not looking for an exemption that says they can host a circus does that make sense it's more of whatever they've already got on campus i want to be they're not aza accreditations you know they, they don't have that but i i don't want to prohibit them from um what they have on campus already um, using for educational purposes, even if they happen to be on this list of animals that might not be, be you know, that, that we are trying to ban, essentially. Um, so, so I wonder if the word hosted could be changed to something else, because it sounds like that might be more of the concern is hosting potentially is um, bringing someone in and saying we're sponsoring this thing versus, um, you know, I, I owned is not the word I want, right? Um, but I'm, I'm still struggling to come up with the correct word to replace hosted with um, that would, would represent sort of where my concern was for, for wanting some sort of exemptions for the institutes of higher education. Um, I'm going to go to Christina again. I think I have to unmute you. Hi. Um, so to respond to that concern, several um, suggestions. Uh, the first would be that you could remove the word hosted and not replace it by anything. Um, and the, the second, uh, just have any demonstration or exhibition by a college or university for bona fide educational research purposes. Uh, secondly, um, you could, when you were debating um, between three and four, whether to use the word performance or exhibition at a, at a brick and mortar, I, you could change the word performance at both the beginning and end of that sentence to exhibition. And between those two should cover your concerns. Um, regarding some of the concerns that were noted earlier, we, we share those concerns. However, I think the phrasing that was suggested by Amherst College is helpful because there is some state 
law and regulation that would give you some something to put your teeth in as to what is bona fide conservation or educational res or research purposes when it comes to animals because there is a current regulatory permitting and licensing system in place in the state of Massachusetts for both wildlife rehabilitators and falconers. And in the case of wildlife rehabilitators, um, it, it, the framework largely calls for these animals to be rewilded and the use of animals in education system, um, in the ed education setting is only for those animals who are unable to be rewilded successfully. So I think if you, uh, so I think that gives you something, the phrase college and university helps you and also the phrase bona fide helps you because you have a state framework to base it on. And then I think if you take out hosted, which I do think is a problematic, um, and then if you change performance in item number three to exhibition in both places, then that might cover you as well. Thank you. Um... Before I go to Laura, um, any committee members have issues with me making those changes that Christina just suggested to the word performance and then deleting hosted? I am not seeing any, so I will make those changes now. Um, and Laura. Uh, just a, a suggestion. I, I agree with Christina that, yeah, taking hosted out um, could be a, a good, uh, change there. And then in addition, what we could add to the end of five is, um, and a not for amusement or entertainment purposes, um, which would, I think, just go that extra step to make it extra clear. And I, I think those two changes with the hosted and that last clause might, you know, close any concern. Um, defer to Rebecca, of course, too. I want to be sure she feels like that's addressed. Thank you, Laura. Cheryl. Um, yeah, I actually, Laura just said what I was thinking. She, um, I want, I'm a little concerned, um, because Comerford Petting Zoo, um, could possibly hold an event. Uh, they call, you know, some of their events now educational and that's a concern. Um, they could possibly be at UMass or one of the colleges and claim it's educational. Um, because at the Big E now, you know, they're claiming to be educational. Um, so I'm not really sure what you can do about that because um, I'm not sure what bona fide educational means. Like, you know, where do you draw the line? But what Laura said actually, you know, um, it's important to add a little something there to five. Um, okay. I mean, I'm concerned about coming for petting zoo or any petting zoos claiming that they're educational. I just added that. I'm seeing a nod from Steve, fellow committee members. Um, any objections to what is now number five until I delete the words Institute of Higher Learning above that and it will now become then become number four. And I am seeing some nods from Rebecca and the other community sponsors that this might be an acceptable at this point addition. Um, two things, um, seeing no hands there, I'm going to delete that. Oh, it didn't become, it'll come number four when I start doing other things, I'm sure. Um, uh, the hand I see is from Christina. I think that brings us to the end um, of the review from what I can tell. Uh, one, anything else from our committee members at this time? Um, I'm not seeing any. Does that mean we are ready to vote on this? Um, if so, um, I will take a motion to recommend the town council I'm, I'm making this motion, assuming that this is the way this, this committee wants to go, make a motion to recommend the town council adopt the bylaw banning the use of wild and exotic animals as amended at the meeting, just as amended. 
um, unless someone thinks we need to have a date on that as amended. Uh, I will make that motion. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Shalini, do you want to make that motion since you're the sponsor? That's okay. Go for it. <laughs> made it. No, 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 that's totally fine. Also, Christina has a hand up. Do we want to hear her I, right I, I now? I will recognize her now that we have the motion on the table. Um, thank you for mm -hmm. making that again. Christina, um, I think you are unmuted. Yes, I'm sorry. Could you scroll down? There's one small thing that you might want to change, and that is to move, that is to put a comma after research purposes and also to move the or down in that series. Minor change, but it does affect the meaning. Um, the or is currently on line two. This one? Oh, um, no, this one. Correct, that one. So, so that, that's a formatting, it, it should get, yeah, it, it the, Because the it, that exempts, any one of those things will exempt it. Thank you. It, I think that's that's what you were referring to, right? Correct. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and and those things will also get a good look at at GOL as we go forward. But thank you for pointing that out. Uh, any other discussion on this motion? Seeing none, we are going to take a vote by roll call. Um, we are going to start with Shalini. Yes. Mandy is a yes. Uh, Evan. Yes. Steve? Yes. That is a 4-0 unanimous vote with one absent. What I will do um, for the sponsors that are on, Rebecca, I will send you this copy when I get it fully fixed and all. Um, and I will copy you on the email that I forward this over to the GOL chair for, um, indicating that this committee has now finished with it. Um, and and everything like that so that you are kept in the loop um and that the gol chair knows who to contact i will keep shalini in that loop too as the counselor sponsor for that it will move on to gol at this point for their review uh thank you all for showing up um and and for for asking us to do this and for shalini for sponsoring it we will move it on to the next committee for review yeah, just, a quick, just a quick thank you to Rebecca and everyone else and also to Mandy Joe for being inclusive and reaching out to the universities and everyone's thoughtful comments. I really do believe every act of kindness right now really has ripple effects. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody. And Shalini, thank you so much for sponsoring. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Strong ditto there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. And you guys are free to leave and sign off <laughs> and with that we are going to move on to our next action item we are close to on time um and that is a title that i could barely come up with which was master plan zoning process and zoning bylaw revisions we have rob has not rejoined us it looks like um I, he he will probably be on soon i assume um Christine Brestrup is here, and Christine Gray Mullen, our planning board chair, is joining us again. We thank you for that. Um, what we forgot to do last night, Christine, is thank you for all your service as planning board chair. I know you are not, um, your term is up in about a month, so this may end up time in front of our committee. Um, so I want to say thank you for your service on the planning board and all you have done um, for the town during all of that time and in the last year or I think it's been a year that you've been chair um, and all the hard work you've put in. So it's a weird title here um, and and I think the preview of why this is on here was in the CRC report um, of last night. Uh, on July 1st the planning board had a discussion at the behest of Christine Restrup, the planning department head, um, regarding the master plan and our request to the planning board to update that with um, some changes. And after that discussion, the planning board happened to vote unanimously to recommend, request that the council consider putting the update on hold, uh, adopting the approved master plan as it now stands, and focusing on bylaw changes. So this um, 
whole session is to start with that um, and hear from Christine Vestrup first about what um, prompted her to bring this up with the planning board to have that discussion um, to then go to the planning board and how they came to vote unanimously for that request um, so that maybe we can consider it, do our own request to potentially the council based on that, um, and then move on to zoning process. We have a, a zoning flow chart, um, but talk about, I believe there were some things that came up in that planning board discussion about workload, um, not just for the planning department, but for the planning board themselves. Um, and so that's why it's this kind of nebulous title. Um, but I'd like to start with Christine Brestrup and her, you know, just, just give, give her a chance to talk about the master plan, what it's been like trying to update it and what, what prompted bringing this concern that you have to the planning board that then resulted in a unanimous vote to request the council essentially stop the update process and just adopt the master plan. May I speak? Yes. Thank you. So um, we began work on the master plan update probably in January or February and um, soon realized that we weren't really changing much. What we were doing was giving information about how we had or had not accomplished some of the things that were included in the master plan or recommended in the master plan. And it really just, um, in my mind, I started off with the chapter that I'm most familiar with, the land use chapter, and it really became more like um, reporting on things that we, that had changed, reporting on things that we'd done. And it didn't really seem like, um, much of an update to the master plan. And I, and I think I got that impression from hearing um, or getting feedback from some of the um, planning board members. So um, rather than you know being a master plan light, um, it, it really turned into more of a report. We already have um, several plans that have been accomplished since the adoption of the master plan, including um, a transportation plan, a housing market study, a housing production plan, um, open space and recreation plan, et cetera, et cetera. The ECAC is currently working on a climate action adaptation and resiliency plan. So we have all of these things that are kind of um, part of or could be incorporated into the master plan. But um, the master plan itself seems to be pretty solid. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from planning board members saying that there's really nothing that they strongly disagree with in the body of the master plan. And it, that includes, you know, members of the planning board who come from fairly different um, points of view. Um, so the planning board seems to be kind of comfortable with the master plan and is almost saying, well, maybe we don't need to update it at this time. We're probably going to be starting an update on the master plan in 2025 anyway, because um, by 2030, um, the town council will need to adopt a new master plan. So um, the planning board discussed um, why, what, what could we do with the master plan? Well, we could look at the implementation matrix and we could talk about what we've accomplished and what we haven't accomplished in the imp implementation, in implementation matrix. That's chapter 10 of the master plan. And really zero in on things that we want to um, take up and want to uh, move forward with and um, with the advice of town council, which of these things do we want to move forward with? So, so rather than spending a lot of time at this time, um, you know, trying to rewrite or update the text of the master plan, why not look at what the master plan says and see what we should or should not implement? Another aspect of this is that, um, as I said, ECAC is working on this climate action adaptation and resilience plan that is due to be finished by the end of the year. And our impression originally, um, the impetus for updating the master plan, we thought was that town council had a lot of questions about, well, why didn't we include more about um, resiliency and climate change, et cetera. So um, once ECAC has, has finished its work, that seems like an appropriate time to try to incorporate, either incorporate their ideas into the body of the master plan or um, take a vote of the planning board to uh, inc incorporate that plan by reference into the master plan. So 
that plan, that climate action plan, was supposed to have been done in June um, for various reasons, I think including COVID. Um, the timeline for that has been extended to the end of the year. So um, we won't really have the body of that information for a few months. In addition to that, we had wanted to have um, Stephanie Ciccarello, who is very involved in that, working with ECAC, and she's the sustainability coordinator. We wanted to have her um, go through the master plan and try to infuse it with um, issues related to climate action and resiliency, but perhaps that could be uh, accomplished by finishing this climate action plan and incorporating the whole thing as, by reference. Um, so in the end, it seemed like there was a lot of energy that was being generated both from town council and from planning board members to look at the zoning bylaw and try to change some of the things that are difficult about the zoning bylaw, things that result in buildings that we don't like or things that result in buildings being too close or not enough um, opportunity to have residential use close to downtown or whatever the issues are that we have been seeing and talking about. In addition, another one was just recently brought up or I shouldn't say brought up, but kind of um, brought to light by Mandy Johanneke talking about um, demolition delay in the historic commission. Um, we've long known that mixed use buildings are a problem. Parking is a problem. Um, we need to incorporate design guidelines into our zoning bylaw. We have problems with the transition zones around the BG and issues related to setback and height of buildings. So since these issues are so interesting to people, pressing on us. Um, it seemed that it was a better use of town focus and resources to kind of change our um, view. And rather than working on the master plan, which as I've described some of the difficulties involved in that, refocus our energy on working on things that people really feel the need for. They feel some urgency to tackle. So I think that's that was um, one of the impetus for the discussion that came before the planning board on July 1st. And um, the planning board did uh, agree um, that we shouldn't abandon the master plan, but perhaps with some small tweaks, including incorporating the plans that we've already done and looking at the implementation plan and setting up an implementation, uh, whether it was a committee or some sort, something like that, eventually in a few months, uh, maybe we could then kind of put the master plan aside for a few years and really focus on the zoning bylaw. So that's what we are bringing to you. And I did send Mandy Jo an email this afternoon I uh, had a conversation with Christine Gray Mullen um, to um, kind of remind me exactly of what the motion was. I, I listened to the tape of the July 1st meeting this afternoon, and, and together we um, have put together the wording uh, of that um, decision that the planning board made. So uh, I don't know if um, Mandy has access to that, but you might want to show it on the screen. Um, that the motion was made by Christine Gray Mullen, seconded by David Levenstein, and there was a seven to zero vote in favor of refocusing attention and resources from the master plan effort onto the uh, changes to the zoning bylaw that we all know that we need so, so much, so desperately. I'm going to try and put that on the screen now. Um, let's see if I can do this. so that everyone can read it. Do you want me to read it? Um, sure, you can read it out loud. At the July 1st, 2020 meeting of the planning board, Christine Gray Mullen moved that the planning board recommend to town council that they consider adopting the approved master plan as is for now and focus the town's attention and resources on the zoning bylaw changes, including establishing design, design guidelines and revisit the issue of the master plan at a later date. David Levenstein seconded, 
And after discussion, the vote was seven to zero to zero in support of the motion. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, Christine Gray Mullen, would you like to talk about the, the planning boards thinking around this and the discussion anymore, um, add anything? Uh, Chris did a great job summarizing pretty much how it all went down. I just wanted to stress from the part of the planning board that we really were backing her on this situation uh, because we've been watching. There's just too much on the plate for the planning department and um, Chris Bestrup specifically. And to do anything right, we, we felt we were too scattered even ourselves. So by just the master plan is the planning board's responsibility. And one of the things that came out of this as Chris started to dive into doing an update is um, there is this thing she was saying, the master plan implementation committee that is spelled out specifically in the master plan is a committee that's supposed to um, sort of be the oversight and, and keep the initiative going and keep everyone aware of the master plan being there and, and each year all these things that get done. So since we haven't done that for 10 years, we really realized right off the bat, like, oh, we don't have that information being collected. So we do highly recommend, and this is in the planning board's world, not your all, but that committee needs to start happening so that we will be in better shape to redo the master plan properly in 2030. And just one other reminder that, you know, we were doing this as a directive from town council. We've already approved this master plan and it is our master plan and we want you all to adopt it. But, you know, there was this sentiment that, oh, does it need to be updated? And I think what's happened is we've given it all a hard look and we think it's okay. It's a framework. No one, you know, of course, could it be better? Yeah, but that's why you keep redoing them every 20 years. Um, and COVID's going on, and we don't know, even if the efforts we make right now to update it, um, you know, it could be a brand new world in a couple of years. So with that, if that gets removed off Chris Bestrup's plate and her department, um, there were some other things that we analyzed as a planning department. Um, the planning department, I mean, the planning board needs to get this master plan implementation committee going, and it could involve two or three or, you know, I don't know how many members would want to be involved in that. And that takes up some bandwidth from people. And the planning board is already um, a pretty rigorous, intense uh, committee to be on. So um, we also looked at the zoning subcommittee also um, is maybe not being needed and that also being able to reduce uh, workload on Ms. Bestrup and her department as one less meeting they have to do every other week. Um, and we can talk about that more. So uh, we are really pushing, pushing. We want to get those bylaws starting to be changed and updated and modernized. And we also stress that design guidelines we're realizing are really critical and other towns have them and we don't. And this could, could help us um, take care of not using, like we're talking about the SPR and that, you know, when that starts being looked at as the tool to control design, that's not what it, it's supposed to do or be and, and it doesn't do. They, they get accepted. Um, through the SPR process, but by having other better bylaws and guidelines that would be critical. So um, we're pushing back at you all to please rethink, uh, adopt possibly sooner rather than later, and then redirect us what we should be working on, especially the planning department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any Thoughts before we move on, uh, thoughts on master plan and the unanimous recommendation or request from the planning board, Steve. Yeah, so first of all, we don't often see 700 votes from the, the planning board, so that speaks volumes. Uh, but the second thing is that you really had me at COVID. So the work in updating the master plan really started pre-COVID. So despite, I mean, COVID has distracted everyone right now, but it's gonna be even more distracting as we try to update a master plan that's talking about things like density and public transportation and how we use the public way, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is fluid right now. 
And so there's basically nothing settled. And we would have a really hard time just saying change this to that without looking at the way we use sidewalks or the way we, you know, on and on and on. All of this is important, but I don't think that, I, I think that accelerating the new master plan from the schedule that, you know, Chris described to me would be much more favorable than trying to now update this with um, both with your workload, but then also with our change of the way we think about the built environment. Thank you. Shalini. Yeah, I agree as well with this uh, suggestion. And I had a question about the zoning bylaws. Uh, I agree again with that suggestion too, that we focus in on zoning bylaws and specifically focusing on what's most needed. And that's my question is how do we determine what are the zoning bylaws that we want to tackle right away immediately ASAP? And for example, I just got an email from a local doctor who's uh, been asking about um, the changes in zoning bylaws because her practice is in a research park. And every time she wants a change, my understanding is that it requires more money, time and effort because it's a special permit then. So, I mean, that's an example of we are pushing our doctors, professionals away from our town because we, it's so hard for them to find a space that allows their practice to thrive. So to me that like we need doctors more than now, now more than ever. So that to me seems like a good place, one of the good, you know, important zoning bylaws to change. But I'm also looking for guidance. How do we determine which one and how do we start? Let's hold off on the zoning bylaw question till we finish the master plan question. Um, I am hearing two, I've heard two people support, essentially support what the planning board has recommended with respect to the master plan. Um, Evan has not raised his hand. We are missing one member. He is throwing his thumb up. So is there a motion um, that should be going to the council from CRC related to this? And if so, would someone like to make that? You guys are going to make me come up with it, aren't you? Evan? So, so I guess w essentially there, the planning board motion had a whole lot of stuff involved in it, but it sounds like our motion is simply to recommend the town council adopt the master plan. Is there a feeling that it needs to be more complex than that? Um, Cause I feel like all of that broader context can just be explained in a report. So I guess my question is, do we want just a simple adopt the master plan and we explain the context or do we feel like it needs to be as complex as the planning board's motion? I think, I think my thoughts were maybe something in between, um, but I'm willing to go with whatever the committee was something that that reflects on the original request of the planning board to update. So something that says recommend the town council um, and, and 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 we put in that request to the planning board. So I don't know what it would be. The planning board was, um, you know, we had a couple of them, but recommend the town council. I guess it would just be if we adopted the master plan. I think you're right, Evan. If we just recommend adoption of the master plan, that would sort of stop the update of the master plan in some sense. But right. would we want to make a statement stopping the, if, if we don't feel beyond just recommending and as is, um, we don't have to. Steve. Sorry, um, Steve, you didn't have your hand up. <laughs> I, I, so I is mean, the motion, to, I was gonna say, is the motion, Evan, to recommend the town council adopt the master plan as is? I would make that motion. I'm making that motion. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I will second it just to move things along. Any discussion on that before we move to the other two areas? Not seeing any, we will vote. I believe I am the first one to vote. So I am a yes. Uh, Evan? Yes. Steve? Yes. Felony? Yes. That is a 4-0 unanimous vote with one absent.
I want to thank the planning board and the planning department for bringing this one to our attention and asking us to use our staff time and planning board time more wisely. Um, we will forward this motion on to the council. Uh, Christine, you raised your hand. Gray, Gray Mullen. <laughs> Christine's. Um, thank you. I think that was an appropriate motion. Um, but please, I hope either with you all as CRC or the town council, there can be some discussion and prioritization to bylaws, um, which ones, and you know, if you need uh, suggestions to reach out to Ms. Bestrup or the planning board, we do have an ongoing um, short list. It's been there for years of things that we knew that needed to be worked on. I think you've probably seen it in the past, but these things need to come back. Um, because you are all really the drivers of this, the starting of this, and the end of this. This is where you are the ones who um, make these changes happen. And um, your guidance and um, pursuit of this is what's going to help prioritize Ms. Bestrup and her department and the town resources. You know, we're in tough times and there's a million to do's. Uh, but I think we really have to be smart as a town in really focusing on what has the most bang for the buck, what is going to help our economy as we come out of COVID, you know, as Shalini was saying, you know, supporting businesses, making processes maybe a little less um, difficult or expensive, because it, like everyone goes back to the big buildings. It's not just the big buildings. It's about the whole town and what property owners need and what um, small businesses need and what the residents need. We still have those capital projects that are out there that need to be built and we're going to need the money for that. So um, thank you. Thank you all for your hard work. It's been a pleasure working with all of you and um, I look forward to seeing some new bylaws. Thanks. Thank you for that. Feel free to stay on. Your, your part's not done yet. <laughs> Uh, Christine Brestrup, and then we will we will go to committee, I think, for some questions. I just off. wanted to note that um, we are looking for guidance um, about your priorities, but some things have already gotten some traction, and um, I'm going to mention the uh, demolition delay bylaw. Um, that was something that the Historical Commission has been working on for years. The Historical Commission personnel have changed. We have a new... Um, planner in our office who's going to be taking over work with the Historical Commission. There seems to be a lot of interest in that particular bylaw. Um, Mandy Jo Haneke brought it to the attention of town council recently. So I guess what I wanted to say is there are some things that already have a certain amount of traction. And I've asked um, Ben Brager in our department to be kind of the Mm, go-to person, the point person for um, redoing the de demolition delay bylaw, bringing in what the Historical Commission has already worked on, bringing in what the Building Commissioner has already worked on, trying to put together um, a single proposal. And that's something that actually, perhaps it doesn't rise to the top of the list of priorities of town council, but it's already got some traction. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and um, kind of say that we can work on a couple of things at the same time, work on things that we've already got going in the pipeline and work on things that the town council gives us to uh, have as our priorities. So we, we, we don't have to just focus on one set of things is that's what I wanted to, to say. Thank you. Um, Shalini. Oh, I, we have uh, the building commissioner Rob Moore with us and I would love to hear from his experience what he thinks about this issue and the kind of changes he might propose if this is the right time for that. That is perfectly the right time. Rob. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, there, there are just so many <laughs> and where, where to choose and where to, where to start. So um, I don't even want to start naming off, you know, but, you know, just so many um, areas of the bylaw that we could begin working on and thinking about how we change things and how we regulate less special permits, you know, getting a better handle on what we want things to look like. Um, it really is just all over the place. Okay, um, 
I guess one of the thoughts I had, um, we, we've, Dave, Dave will know and Steve will know, we've had these discussions many times about how, what, what's this process? This goes back to the flowchart part of what I put on the agenda. Um, as mentioned earlier, planning board's got a lot of work on its plate. The planning department has a lot of work on its plate. Um, and we've been trying to figure out where CRC fits into that, where zoning subcommittee may or may not fit into that. Um, and, you know, we've heard from a number of planning board members that, that they don't necessarily want to be involved in the writing and early review of the bylaws that maybe that should be part of CRC. Instead, I'd like to hear from uh, the planning board chair on that, um, Christine Brestrup, uh, who's the one that as planning director is sort of figuring out where all these bylaw changes are and then is the one that has to show up to all the meetings wherever they are presented um, to, to deal with in terms of as we move forward with the building commissioner drafting changes with um, the demo delay changes getting made with any other changes, you know, Chris, Christine Brestrup mentioned a whole bunch of stuff that could be ready. Um, what is the most logical progression of where they show up first before they're ready for hearing? Um, we have the, the SPR voting requirements that, that didn't really follow a true process until it hit the hearing because I, I kind of drafted some stuff. Christine and Gray Mullen and I worked together to sort of come up with some language. We brought it to the two committees before we went to the council and all of that. Um, but when something comes from the planning department, what would, what, what do people feel might be the, uh, n not just the most efficient use of time, but, but the, the best sort of, um, method through getting the feedback um, back and forth. Rob, Christine, Chris, uh, any thoughts on that as we look towards asking you to prioritize stuff? Christine Brestrup? Christine Brestrup. Ah, so, um, well, like I said, there are a number of things that are already either written and were never presented to town meeting, were written and were defeated at town meeting, are being written now. Um, so I, I think that from our standpoint, the reasonable path to go would be to bring, start to bring some of these things to the planning board and have the planning board um, send them to town council if the planning board thinks these are good things. Um, I know that members of the CRC and town council watch planning board meetings from time to time. And if you are watching these meetings and hearing things that you're interested in, you can certainly um, contact me. Um, so my comfort level would be served by bringing things to the planning board and having them determine um, whether they wanted to bring them to town council or not. Um, if you have a different approach if you would like to have planning staff approach town council directly although that seems a little bit out of whack um, I'd be I'd be willing to consider that but it seems from my standpoint we work closely with the planning board the planning board works with the zoning bylaw a lot and they would be um, my first stop really if I had uh, ideas about um, the zoning bylaw so that's what I think Thank you. Um, Rob or Christine Graymullen, any thoughts on that as we move towards getting some potential changes ready? Christine Graymullen. You're muted. Thanks. Um, I just, thinking about how it was working or not working the last um, few years, um, part of what's happened is some of the bylaws we need to change right now are really complex. They've been hanging out there for over a decade and they're not easy answers. I'm thinking specifically of the limitations of the BL district. I'm thinking of the right balance of inclusionary zoning downtown. I'm thinking of 
town-wide varying levels of parking um, requirements. Um, these are really complicated issues that are far more complicated than anything that the zoning subcommittee or the planning board, you know, people look at us as the experts. Well, maybe we know a little bit more about zoning than other people, but we're not the experts. So I just want to toss it out there that we're looking at the um, planning department and their resources, but I want to also suggest that we do have, we already have some money to hire consultants to do some of this. Sometimes you need an outside specialist who does this for municipalities across the nation or at least regionally. And they've already, you know, we're not asking, it's a bit of a boilerplate. They come in, they already know what they're supposed to do and they tweak it to fit our needs. And at that point, the working with the planning department, and then it's, vetted out and fine-tuned, you know, and brought to the planning board. That gives an opportunity for the public to come in and, and give their thoughts on it. And it gets a little more um, refined. And at that point, um, to me, it would be more ready to then go to CRC and town council. But I just wanted to really put in there that also the need for consultants, and I think Chris Bastrop will um, back me up on that, that some of these are this is why they, ha if it was that simple, we would have done it years ago. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Shalini. So something I saw, one of the workshops at the MMA conference that we go to, and it was uh, uh, this consultant who presented in the, I think it was the economic development forum, maybe workshop. And she, what was really appealing about her particularly was it sounded like she's a zoning consult by law consultant and helps with designing the chain making the changes in a downtown or whatever what was appealing about her is every project that she consulted towns with they seemed to be money coming in from the state because she knew what so you know like what brings in smart growth money, for example. And I don't remember exactly, I can pull up the name of the person exactly, but it seemed like she not only came in with the consulting thing, but also had connections and the know-how of what kind of changes in our town would make a thriving downtown, for example, but also bring in appropriate fundings from different levels and grants to implement some of that. I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. So I think one of the things that I'm, I'm starting to get a handle on is, as we figure out how this works, is we've heard it before and I'm hearing it again. The planning department, the planning board, uh, the building inspector all need some sort of guidance and they're looking to the council for that guidance. And the question, I guess, as Shalini was putting along with the two Christines and Rob is, how do we get to that guidance? Um, so thoughts from our committee on a couple of options, and, and I have not thought many of these through. One is presentation directly to the whole council on what could be done, what some thoughts are, maybe some thoughts from the planning department on and building inspector on what could be prioritized um, directly to the council first, and then maybe a referral to CRC or, um, or not a referral, and the council sort of talking that through and handing that guidance to the planning department. Um, Another thought is that that sort of we schedule a presentation in CRC with that chart um, with um, the planning department, uh, potentially planning board, potentially not. I'd like to hear the planning board chairs about that. Um, CRC comes up with, based on all of this presentation, uh, a recommendation to the council on what it thinks um, the the priorities should be, and then the council can have that discussion with sort of a CRC recommendation there. Um, there's probably 20 different other options that I'm not thinking of right now, um, but I'm, I just want to throw that out there as maybe that's what we need, we need to figure out how we get that guidance to Rob and Christine um, and Chris to start moving these and, and which ones we want them to work on. Uh, Dave. You've got your hand raised. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm having kind of deja vu. I feel like we've been here, we've been at this station before and 
the train left and now we're back at the same station. I don't know if the track goes around and around. I hope it doesn't. Circle. <laughs> but um, I feel like we spent a lot of time on process back pre-COVID and during COVID. Um, I guess I'm trying to recreate in my mind where we left that off. And I thought, and I could be wrong on this, but um, I know we talked about you know, this idea of Rob and Chris coming into the council and the council giving them feedback. And I thought we kind of moved away from that. And I, I really thought we, we kind of put the, um, we put the responsibility with Rob and with Christine to really kind of generate in their minds as the professionals doing this work, what the priorities were and I can't recall whether it was bringing it to the planning board or bringing it to the planning board. And I'm going back to your um, flow chart, Mandy, which I thought we did a lot of work with the planning board on and with CRC on. And so I'm just kind of wondering, I hope we're not abandoning all that work because I thought it was really good work. But I thought we were gonna let Rob and Christine really come up with kind of the template of priorities to then vet that with, with the planning board, with the CRC, and it was really incumbent upon, I thought, the CRC and maybe you acting as chair of the CRC um, to bring that to the council and kind of say, here's the direction we're going, council. Uh, now's the time to say, and, and there are committee reports, right? Each meeting or periodically. So you could, through your report, say, here are the areas of affordable housing, uh, uh, downtown zoning, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the directions. Here are the main priorities that are being set right now. Uh, speak now or, you know, or forever hold your peace because we're moving in these directions. So, so likely the, the, the zoning proposals you'll be seeing will fall in the following categories. But again, it's been a while. We've been through COVID. That's kind of where, where I thought we were going. But Rob, Christine, Christine, others, maybe I'm Maybe I'm seeing things through a different lens, but I thought that was kind of where we were going. Christine Brestrup. So I have to say that um, we haven't thought a lot about zoning priorities recently. We've been working very hard on trying to get the businesses back in, uh, in running shape. And we've been working on these um, specific zoning amendments that uh, have been brought to the town council, the article 14 and the article 11. Um, in addition to that, you know, people are ramping up and applying for a lot of um, permits and coming before the planning board to get site plan review, et cetera. So there hasn't been a lot of focus on um, the zoning bylaw recently. So Dave is uh, sort of reminding me of where we were um, back in February, I guess. And I think Rob and I would be perfectly happy to come up with um, priorities and bring them to town council and present them and then get some guidance about which ones town council thinks or CRC, whichever group you think would be a more appropriate one to go to. Um, which, so get guidance on which ones we should focus on in the immediate future. There's, um, so there's that, and then there's this other track that Rob has talked about working on, which is really revamping the entire zoning bylaw. So those are two things that are um, being proposed. They're not mutually exclusive, but they're not necessarily completely wedded to one another. The complete recodification of the zoning bylaw is a project. It's a very long-term project that's probably going to take more than a year to accomplish. Meanwhile, we have these specific things that we want to change in the zoning bylaw. And I think those two things can happen at the same time. So um, I have had a recent conversation with Rob about, you know, bandwidth, how much time do we have? How much brain power do we have? When can we get, um, get going on this? And we've talked about towards the end of the summer, um, probably makes sense because by that time um, we will have seen the big uh, rush of outdoor dining or outdoor retail or whatever it is we're going to see um, and that we will have more um, mental capacity for focusing on the zoning bylaw both 
the recodification and the um, figuring out what we think should be the priorities. So I could propose that maybe towards the end of August that we come back to you with a plan, end of August, beginning of September, as to how we're going to approach this, uh, come back to the CRC and, and give you some kind of a presentation about that. Does that make sense? I'm gonna send that question off to the committee. Does that, from a committee's point of view, what Christine just said about a plan for, I think I'm gonna reword it in what I heard, a late August, early September plan that has potential priorities, priorities in a list of what you think might be the most important things to tackle in the near future um, on zoning uh, for discussion and it coming to, and this is where I think I've never been clear, CRC, or town council. And I think that's one of the ones we need to absolutely decide which ones it's going. I will say, I think at one point we decided town council COVID hit and that presentation for a number of reasons has gotten pushed, pushed, pushed on a council agenda. Um, from my vice president and my chair of CRC point of view, I do worry that if, if it goes, you know, I, I have two conflicting things. If it goes directly to the council, it could be seen as something that continues to get pushed, pushed, pushed as we have more, decide we have more important things to deal with. Um, whereas it might not get pushed in CRC at the same time. I know there's a huge risk of it coming directly to CRC and not to the council. Um, because there are not just the five of us that want to talk about zoning on this council. Um, and so maybe a potential a uh, compromise between that is a CRC meeting that is a listed as a full council meeting um, where that presentation might happen. So thoughts from our committee members on what Christine said and and where. Uh, Evan. Yeah, so um, the role in charge of this committee, right, is to advise the council on matters of planning and zoning. And the whole reason we have committees is so that committees can do a bunch of the work ahead of time so that by the time something gets to the council, it's been vetted, it, it, it doesn't need as much uh, discussion or debate. And so I understand the concern about sending zoning, which is of high interest, which can be contentious, to these five people first. But I also feel like if, we send it to the council first, that's not the why are we here, right? Like our whole purpose is to advise the council on these things. Um, and so to me, it actually makes sense for it to come first to this committee to have a discussion about priorities because that's what this committee was tasked to do, which was to advise the council about that. And I think that we're actually, you know, when I'm thinking about the composition of this committee right now, I think that we're actually a well-equipped committee to do that. I mean, we have uh, uh, Steve's tenure on the planning board and his knowledge of the zoning bylaw and his background in architecture. I, I sit on this committee as a renter, um, which is, is important here, I think, um, and as someone who has a lot of background in sustainability um, and climate stuff. We have Shalini, who brings the perspective of economic development. We have Mandy, who has worked on a number of these issues already, and uh, especially with the rental registration bylaw implementation. And we have Sarah, who I think brings a really important perspective, um, both as a farmer, but also, and I'm gonna say this because she says this all the time, as someone who represents a district that is often very skeptical to development. So I think that we're actually a really well-balanced committee to help come up with priorities for the council. Um, and if we present them to the council and the council rejects them, then that's that. But it seems like that's our job, right, as the CRC um, to, to advise the council and to make recommendations when it comes to planning and zoning. And so I, I think that actually the presentation, I also can, uh, that's an entire full council meeting, um, right? I mean, we have 13 people who love to talk, right? And on an issue like zoning, um, it, it just seems to me like it, need, it should be filtered through a committee first um, to, so that the, the council can work more efficiently and expeditiously. Um, I like the idea of, of Rob and Christine coming to us when they can. Um, I also think that this is a committee that has people who are very interested in this stuff. I know I've had conversations with Steve in the past about this. I know I've had a lot of conversations back um, 
in, in December with Shalini about some of this stuff. So I, I also, I'm, I'm hoping that this uh, committee can feel free to also bring our priorities to that meeting to figure out where some of our priorities align with the planning department's priorities um, to move forward. Thank you. Um, Shalini, you had your hand up at one point, but you unraised it. Do you have a comment? It's okay if you don't. No, I was just going back to read the, read the charge for the CRC because I forgot whether we are, I mean, what is the order of the, because I'm completely in agreement with Evan and at the same time, I just knowing the council we have, I think I was just trying to see what is quote, written down in terms of order. Do we go to the town council and then they recommend push it down to us or can it go directly to us and then we make yeah, I was just trying to and the other thing I wanted a clarification was what is the the meaning of recodification of zoning what did that what is I don't I don't remember talking about that so if someone could clarify what that entails that may have been talked about before you were on the committee Rob could you talk about what that that project you're working on in terms of recodification is Yes. Uh, so, you know, that's really looking at um, everything from the structure of the bylaw, um, organizing it, getting it into prepared for digital formatting and going through it page by page, eliminating conflicts, um, looking for ways, to, places to insert these bigger discussion items that we have to have and, 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 and modify larger condition or sections of the bylaw really just kind of establish the framework um, in, a, in an up-to-date way uh, to then move ahead and start putting in these bigger amendments. Thank you. So I, we're, we're going to have to up? run. Just a follow-up oh, sure, question. Challenge. Is that work going to be more than, like, is it more administrative? I don't know what the word is, but is it more impacting our actual implementation of zoning or is it more like cleaning up and administrative i don't know for lack of a better word administrative you know what i mean like will it have practical implications for businesses or is that more something we want to do just to have clean you know like something we did with our bylaws when we changed to town council does that make sense it, yeah, it does. And I, and I think it's both. So, okay. you know, there's definitely the clean it up, make it look and, and work, make it easier, less complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything's in there where we want it to be, no conflicts. But then there's also things like Christine brushed up mentioned the demo delay bylaw. We have problems with the bylaw where it's it's telling you to do one thing and, and, and one section and another and the, okay. you know and the applicants don't know what to do so there are a lot okay. of things like that w that will have an impact on okay. process and from the applicant standpoint great thank you thank you we we are getting to the point where we need to move on in our agenda because uh, we have some important items regarding planning board appointments to do I want to sum up and with what I think is our plan going forward so that we're all clear where we stand. Um, and that is that Rob and Chris are going to work on their sort of idea of priorities for addressing zoning bylaw, um, what changes they may want to see. Um, uh, I, I will send this out to Christine Gray Mullen too, who's here. Um, if planning board gets a chance to talk about it or they have their own ideas, that would be great to have that list too. That that work will happen over the course of uh, August in an attempt to get to a late August or early September um, meeting at CRC. We have a September 1st meeting that might be an ideal date to aim for, um, for a potential discussion of zoning bylaw change priorities and how to prioritize that and give that guidance to everyone. Um, at the same time, we as CRC members will be making our own lists of what we would like to see um, and bringing those lists to that meeting. Um, and I as chair, given that it won't just be us counselors on this committee that have their lists, will reach out to the council through reports um, to the council for asking for other counselors lists that can be brought to that meeting. I would like guidance on whether we should 
potentially make that meeting a meeting of the full council in case other counselors would like to come to that meeting. Um, when we know an exact date, knowing that we're aiming for September 1, but it may not be September 1, because uh, we don't know what will happen in August. Um, and then at that point, we'll have a meeting and we'll discuss and at some point vote to make recommendations to the council on the guidance to provide to the planning department on sort of an even more focused priority list beyond what the planning department and building commissioner have, have brought. Um, that's my sum. I know I see the planning board chair's hand up. I will take hers and then any comments on that sum summary and then we will move on in our meeting to the next item agenda. Christine Gray Mellon. Thank you. That's all very clarifying and I'm also speaking to Christine Bestrup. I think we can put this on the planning board August 5th um, meeting. Like we've mentioned before, there's been a long-standing prioritization table that has sort of come out of the zoning subcommittee and that planning board works. We will re-examine that, give it a look, you know, with COVID and current times and workloads. And we will sharpen that up and maybe also do a short list of like the top five really like, please, please, please. And we'll get that. And that will probably help Chris Bestrup too on focusing um, her list that we'll get to you for uh, later in the month. Thank you. Sounds good. Any other comments from our counselors, committee members? Seeing none, I want to thank Rob and Christine, you guys um, for coming to the meeting, for talking about stuff. Also, all Christines, <laughs> it's so confusing having two, um, for coming, for taking the time. We are going to get through this. We're going to get that guidance to you as we figure all of this out. This will be the first time it's the most um, painful to get to, I think, and then we'll know how it works. Um, and it won't be as painful and as time consuming moving forward once we get through this first time. Um, so thank you. At this point, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Um, everyone may feel free to stay. It is the presentation and discussion items, 3A, update on the status of the planning board appointments. Um, so at this time, uh, according to the process we have adopted, um, we need to make a decision on whether the current, um, whether the pool is sufficient or not. This is part of, I believe, step three in our guidance. Um, and that um, I, at this point, we have a list. Um, we've got information as to who has applied. Um, that information, based on that information, we need to make a decision on sufficiency. Um, I have emailed applicants who have filled out CAFs since the new um, bulletin board posting was done on July 1 and shortly before that, since, since the, I, I guess what I should say is since the um, responsibility for a making recommendation has changed to CRC. I have done that. I have received responses from everyone that has filled out a CAF at that time saying they are still interested. Uh, I have not contacted anyone who filled out a CAF prior to that. I spoke to Evan uh, yesterday, I think it was, on that. Um, we have information as to what OCA did in the past on that and where those applicants may have stood. Um, a thinking is if we declare the pool sufficient that um, all applicants on that list, unless they are no longer residents, would be contacted for potential submission of a statement of interest, um, whether or not they responded no or yes to when OCA was looking at this matter. Um, but, but we did not reach out, I did not reach out before this. Um, so I would like some information um, if we're ready to vote um, on whether the pool at this point is sufficient. We have potentially three openings we are trying to fill um, in terms of terms that are up. Thoughts? Shalini? I'm raising Evan's hand. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. 
No, I want you to speak to this because uh, when but you seem to have, oh, at this point, you have the most experience in the appointments. So, um, right. So if, we, if we're looking at the process, right, um, a couple of things that we're looking for is we want, um, we want to review the pool holistically in the context of um, the, the board and the composition and the vacancies. And so I, I have the process in front of me, so I'll, I'll just read these three bullets in case um, you all don't have it in front of you. So we're, we're looking for the number of applicants relative to the number of vacancies or impending vacancies. CRC strives to, for more applicants than vacancies. So we have three potential vacancies. We don't discuss numbers of applicants publicly, but we can confirm that we have more applicants than we have vacancies and impending vacancies. So we can check that box. Um, the second bullet is the demographic diversity of the applicant pool. CRC strives for a diverse applicant pool, including racial, economic, gender, and generational diversity. That is a place where I think we can admit we are perhaps lacking a little bit um, in that our pool is, ex from what I remember, is exclusively male um on a on a so um the the planning board right now is um i won't i won't expand on that we i i would say that we aren't necessarily meeting the diversity threshold um i'm not gonna use the word threshold the diversity uh ambitions right that we might have um with regard to the pool. And the third one is the current needs of the body to be appointed, including any current burdens placed on the body by a vacancy. Um, and this I think is a really important one. Um, and the reason is that if there was no burdens on the body whatsoever, we, they could continue on functioning. You might consider um, whether or not uh, we, want to try and recruit a more diverse pool, right? Um, but the reality that we have before us is that uh, we extended the terms of the three members who are up for reappointment to the end of August. We pretty much know that uh, Christine Gray Mullen and David Levenstein are, are going to leave by the end of summer at the latest. Um, and so we don't necessarily have the opportunity to extend their terms. Once they leave, that leaves two vacancies on the planning board, which brings it down to five. And so, of course, we know, at least right now, a special permit requires five. Uh, a, a site plan review requires five. And so what that means is if one member votes no, or if one member is absent, or if one member has a conflict, um, projects come to a standstill. And so if Shalini is asking for my opinion on whether the pool is sufficient, I would say we have more applicants than vacancies. The diversity is not what we would hope it to be, but given the, uh, what I would say, extreme burden that would be placed on the body if we don't fill these vacancies by end of summer, um, because there are two potential vacancies that could really impede the uh, function of the body, I would say that it's, it would be prudent for us to move forward. Also recognizing that just because we declare the pool sufficient doesn't mean that people can't be added to the pool. People who apply next week or two weeks from now um, can still join the pool. The cutoff is once the statements of interest are posted. Um, and so we can declare the pool sufficient to move forward, start setting everything up. That doesn't actually prevent anyone new from joining the pool or doesn't stop us from, from recruiting new people if we feel like we want a more diverse pool. Um, that cutoff isn't until we post the statements of interest. Thank you, Evan. You did that much better than I did <laughs> in, in any of that. So Shalini. Can we um, appoint one person like to replace the male and then continue to get more people till we have a diverse pool for the second? Evan? Yeah, so so um, the part eight CRC recommendation of our process, um, it says 
CRC may choose not to make a recommendation. CRC may also recommend fewer appointments than vacancies or impending vacancies. And so what I would say is, my personal opinion is we should move forward. And if we interview and we feel like there are three mm. great people and we go, you know what? We wish we had, mm. but we wish the pool wasn't 100% male, but these are really three great people. Then we can appoint. If we, if we feel like we only have one or two great people, there's nothing that says that we have to appoint all three. Um, of course, that does place a burden on the body because it leaves a vacancy. Um, but but we, mm. we, we don't lock ourselves into filling all three or any. I mean, if we interview and we're like, we don't think any of these people should be on the planning board, we, we actually don't have to appoint anyone. It's a little awkward, but um, so yeah. I don't think we should go into it with that mindset. I think we should, but, but we have that option, sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on sufficiency at this time or are we ready to move to a vote? Because I think our um, process, we assess the pool and yeah, we have to vote to declare the applicant pool sufficient to proceed to interviews. Um, if there is no more, more discussion, I will take a motion if people think it's sufficient. So if someone does think it's sufficient and wants to make the motion, please do so. That's what I'm gonna say. So, so I can make that motion since I've been doing all the talking. Um, so I move that the CRC declare the current applicant pool for the planning board sufficient to proceed to interviews. Second. I'm just writing the motion down. Uh, Shalini seconds. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we will vote. We are starting with Evan. Yes. Uh, Steve. I think that was a yes. You are mutes. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Shalini. Yes. And Mandy is a yes, that is a 4-0 vote. Our pool is declared sufficient. Um, that means we have a couple of additional things to do. And I know it's almost four o'clock, but we're gonna try and get through these things um, and get through minutes. And I hope to do it in less than 10 minutes or maybe more. Um, we'll see how long guidance takes. Um, and so the next thing we have to do at this point is number four, selection guidance. Um, there is a draft of selection guidance in our packet. Um, let me see if I can screen share that. Um, so this is the draft um, in anticipation of the potential for declaring the pool sufficient. I contacted the planning board chair um, for item B. Item A is a exact copy of our uh, process other than number four. Um, which I took from a draft thing that says to be added. Item B is an exact copy per our rules of the email from that I received from the planning board chair, Christine Gray Mullen, um, and all per the rules. Uh, so Evan. Uh, this is just, when we, when we voted, we, we voted to maintain the word term limits there. I think so. Okay, I, I didn't, I, for some reason I thought we had struck that, but I guess maybe, <laughs> it, anyway, it, it seemed weird that we went against term limits, we've still labeled it, but okay, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> At least that's how I had it, I, it could be wrong. <laughs> You're probably right. Shalini. Yeah, I had the same question about term limits. I thought we removed those. I, I will remove it and I will remove it from our adopted process. How about that? Okay. As a Grivner, I screwed up in not highlighting everything we deleted. Okay. <laughs> if everyone thinks that. Um, characteristics of an affected planning board member. I think this is something that we have an option to add, but we do not have to. Is that correct, Evan? Uh, yeah, so um, the first selection guidance um, that, that Oka put together had B, input from the body's chair, put their verbatim, and then A was just the criteria for healthy member body. And then we sort of felt like um, 
the input that we ask for for the body's chair, um, we we might also feel like there are things that we as a council are looking for um, and that aren't covered there. And so that's what we would add there. Um, we don't have to include that. It's basically, if we feel like there is something that we as a committee are looking for that isn't adequately covered by any of the other content there. Um, so, just because I don't think the, the selection guidance that OCA passed was in the packet, right? No, it was not. So, so just to give you an idea of what OCA had in their selection guidance under four, it was uh, one, open-minded, two, able to work in a collaborative spirit, three, openness to compromise, and four, understanding of the regulatory function of the body. Um, of course, that was done with different um, input from the body's chair since uh, the chair has updated her input. Yes. Does uh, anyone, I, oh, sorry, Evan, go. I was gonna say, I, I feel like I see um, all of these four things that Oka had passed in the chair's um, input. In fact, just on the screen right now, I see understand the regulatory function of the board, fair and open-minded. Uh, ability to collaborate and compromise. Um, so that's, that's literally the four things I just read. And so what Oka had put is now in what the chair has provided us. So the only reason for us to repeat those things would be is we wanted to make clear that Oka, I'm sorry, oof, that CRC is is really prioritizing those things. It's not just the chair that's prioritizing those things. Thoughts? Sounds good. Is that a sounds good to add it into our selection guidance too, or just leave it as down here? Steve. Um, to put it under number four or to put it, just leave it where it is. So it's, it's where it is. The question is, which your sounds good, would you also add it up here? No, I just leave it. Is there any CRC member that wants to add anything to item four? Why don't I start with that question? I am seeing no hands. Um, so I think that means I will delete it. Um, and if there are no other requests, um, let me look at my process again, since this is all new for me. Um, we have to vote on this. Yeah, adopted by majority vote. Yep. Adopt them by majority vote. Are we ready to vote on this document? So I will accept a motion to adopt the selection guidance as amended for filling the vacancy. I, I guess it's, yeah, I think it's adopt the selection guidance as amendment for filling the vacancies on the planning board. Did you make that motion or are you just I will make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I think we start with Steve Schreiber. Aye. Shalini? Yes. Mandy's a yes. Evan? Yes. Okay, we've adopted selection guidance now. Um, that means we have to get a tentative schedule for statement of interest deadlines, interviews, and interviews, essentially, and then a meeting for determining interview questions. Um, let me stop this share. Um, our upcoming CRC meetings are August 4th, August 18th, and September 1st. Um, planning board has a meeting on August 5th, and assuming they go every two weeks, I believe they also have one on August 19th and September 2nd, the days after our meetings, which means if we were looking for interviews, we would be looking for, I believe, given what we'd go with, 
the Wednesdays between that, August, either August 12th or August 26th. Um, there is a council meeting on August 20, what are we, August 17 and August 24? I guess the 31st, yeah. I didn't, I didn't write the council meeting days down. I think we have meetings on the 3rd, the 17th, and the 31st for the council. And the 31st, yes, not the 24th, okay. That's what I couldn't remember. Yes, and the 31st. So given those meetings, and the 17th is generally set for only um, town manager evaluation at this point, whereas the 31st is supposed to have other items on it. Um, it looks like we would be aiming for the 31st to the council, which would be aiming for interviews, I think given that on the 26th is the Wednesday. Yep. That sounds like a good plan. Um, which means given our selection guidance or process, statements of interest need to be posted one week in advance of the interviews. Um, and so they need to be due sometime before that to give us time to post them. Um, which would put them posted the 19th. Any idea on when we should have a deadline for them? Evan, uh, you never did statement of interest. Do you know, you know, would two days sound like a reasonable time if we had it due the 17th to turn it around for posting? Yeah, I mean, so again, my, my recommendation is that once the, once you've confirmed with the applicants that have applied, that they're available on that date to just post that meeting, just do a skeleton posting. Um, so then all it really takes on the 17th or 18th is you emailing Athena and saying, can you add these documents to the public meeting posting? Um, and if you give her a heads up that she needs to be able to do that on that day, she can make sure. So should be, that should be plenty of time. Okay. So we'll aim for a deadline of the 17th of August, uh, posting on the 19th, interviews on the 26th. Uh, what time for those interviews? I think planning, Chris, Christine Gray Mellon, are you still there? Yep. <laughs> what time does the planning board normally start its meetings? 6.30. 6.30. So do we want to try for a 6.30 on the 26th for interviews? And is it that you want the remaining planning board members to be there or? No, we're, we're trying to schedule it on a non-planning board night. Um, the goal is to have the interviews on the night that the body normally meets in terms of day and time so that Oh, like an okay. uh, So I, I was, was wondering, do they start at 7, 6.30? Because uh, we'd try to start at about a similar time, even though it's not for planning board, right, Evan? Is that what you guys did? Yeah, obviously, with some flexibility given applicant and counselor schedules. Okay. So we will tentatively go for 6.30 on August 26th for the interviews. I will contact all the applicants. Um, last thing on this before we move to minutes. Uh, I think Evan can correct me if I missed anything is my next steps are to contact all of the applicants um, and give them the selection guide and follow the process, but essentially give them the dates we've done, check with them to make sure they're available on the interview date, give them the deadlines for the statement of interest, everything that we're supposed to under our process, give them for filling out the statement of interest. Um, and I will be contacting in terms of the information we have, all the applicants that are still interested, those that um, were contacted by Evan and either responded yes or no, or did not respond, but, but not to those that responded, they are no longer uh, residents. 
uh, is, is I, I'm, I'm not going to, my plan is not to contact those that told Evan three months ago that they were no longer residents of town. Um, it, but contact pretty much everyone else that we know of that has submitted a CAF. Even if they had indicated they were not interested three months ago when Evan contacted them. Does that sound like a plan for the committee? One thing you might just for simplicity's sake want to do is the ones who we know are interested is confirm a date with them. And then you can email everyone else and say, we're doing interviews for the planning board on this day. You told us three months ago, you weren't interested. If you are interested and can, and you're available that night, let me know. Um, but I don't want, because my concern is I don't want you reaching out to everyone and feeling like you have to wait to confirm a date until you hear back from people who might not ever actually respond to you. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. Shalini. Sorry, I have to leave. Is that okay? That is fine. I think we're almost done. I think we're down to and just And I trust minutes. Joe. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other comments on the job I have to do now for planning board? Seeing none, we are going to move to minutes. We have three sets. I really want them passed so that our minutes are not too backed up. That's why we're going to try. We have a set for June 10, which was joint with the planning board. We have a set for June 16 and a set for June 30. Those were not joint meetings. The planning board has adopted the minutes for June 10th. Uh, they adopted the minutes without any of the deletions that you saw that I posted. Our meeting did not have their, their initial stuff and their end stuff. Um, so I deleted pretty much everything between the planning board's call to order and our call to order and then everything after our adjournment um, and fixed that it's our minutes. So that's what I did to that. But they have, those are the, those are the adopted minutes from the planning board. Um, any suggested changes to those three sets of minutes? I'll move to approve. Steve moves to approve those three sets. Is there a second? Second. Evan seconds, any other discussion? Uh, I think we're down to me again. Um, I am a yes, Evan. Yes. And Steve? Yes. Those three sets are approved. Um, with that, I don't have announcements. Uh, next agenda preview will be more planning board appointments. I haven't even thought of the next agenda. We've almost cleared out most of what we're doing. So I think we might end up with some housing policy on it. Um, Evan? So um, between now and then, I would recommend you reach out to the council for them to submit interview questions. Okay. Um, and then that, sh that that's going to need to be on our next agenda is developing interview questions for the interviews. Okay. And we may not finalize them because we might wait to finalize them. We'll see. Till our 18th meeting on the 18th, but we can start on the 4th. I'll have to look at the process. I will work on all of that. I haven't well, fully. We, we're giving interview questions to, app, to interviews in advance, right? Yes. Okay. And so you're. Oh. Okay, no, no, that works. That's, that, it can still get them. SOIs are submitted the 17th. If we finalize the interview questions on the 18th, we will have the SOIs in order to be able to do it. That does not mean we can't talk about them on the 4th. Right, and okay. Supposed to finish. I got my dates mixed up a little no, bit. No, I, I think we're good, but thank you for that reminder. I, I will go through the process and, and work my way through and probably call you a couple times to make sure I'm not screwing anything up. Um, but yeah, I think we've cleared out nearly everything we have to do. We'll see what zoning is, but I'm not sure we'll have anything there. So it might be planning board appointments and housing. Um, I'm not sure there's anything else. Uh, anything else from anyone? I thank you guys for letting us go 15 minutes over because uh, we had a lot to do today and I was trying to fit it all in and get it all done to clear off an agenda. <laughs> um, thank you so and, much. And, you. and also with that, we are adjourned till August. Fourth. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Angela. Where's my